hear me? And I'll say it again. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I want to, before I start my talk, I, I want to relate a quick story to you. I was in a, a bar in London a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a UX social event, and a tall, dark stranger came up to me, and he said, I want to do a really great UX event in Lisbon next year. And would you like to come? And people always talk about doing really good things, and they don't always pull them off. They don't always follow through. Uh, well, I couldn't go to the first UXLX, but uh, Bruno pulled it off. And uh, I heard it was an amazing event. I heard it from people who put on amazing events that it was changing the way they wanted to, to hold their own events. So uh, I want to make sure we acknowledge what Bruno and his team have done. If we don't get to it by the end of the day, I want to make sure we do it now. So if it's okay, could we give those guys a round of applause? Okay. Wonderful job. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me, Bruno. Uh, I'm going to talk about getting beyond user research. Um, I, I'm, I wear two hats. As Bruna said, I'm a publisher, but I still do consulting. Uh, in fact, I've been a, a solo consultant now for about 10 years in information architecture. And uh, a lot of the work I've been doing is about getting beyond silos. That in, as an information architect who works with very large organizations, um, I'm always dealing with blobs of content that are separated in ways that are not user-centered. And so that's kind of how I've made my consulting career, is trying to blow up silos. But what I'm finding now is that I'm, I'm finding new silos in a new context in the consulting work I do. And it's kind of disturbing. So um, when I go to a, a new client, I start asking them questions about what they know. What insights do they have? And I'm finding that the insights, the user research they're doing, lives in different silos. So let me give you an example. This is typical for me now. I go to a large organization, and they say, yes, we believe in user research. In fact, we invest quite extensively in user research. You don't have to convince us that this is a good idea. Well, thank goodness. But then what I find is something like this. I start encountering things like you'd expect, the, uh, the reports that come right out of the user research group that are often based on things that look like this, post-it notes after post-it notes after post-it notes. So that's good. That's what you would expect. These are usually the people who bring me in. But then I ask for things like, hey, where are your, what's, let me see your search analytics data. And that might come from someone else. And we don't always know who that someone should be or how to find them in the context of a large organization. OK. Well, what else do you have? Do you have a call center? Are they gathering information about what customers want? Yeah, we have a call center somewhere. Um, we don't know those people, but we'll try to find that stuff for you. And I find that uh, with one recent client, that took something like six months of hunting to find the logs from the call center. Really useful information as a user researcher, but hard to get because of political reasons, because of silos. And then I find, as I'm increasingly interested in analytics data, that there may be different analytics applications installed in different parts of the organization. And there are different people who operate those tools. And they may not have time to talk to me or the people who brought me in. Uh, then I find, in certain contexts, there's something called voice of the customer research, often based on surveys. And then there might be a, a whole pocket of CRM data. I still haven't even seen what this looks like. I've been asking and asking, and I, I still don't know what CRM data looks like. But I think I, I should. I think it would be helpful as a, as a person coming in interested in user research. Now, one of the interesting places that user research often comes out of is the research center. So a lot of large organizations, I think Microsoft Research, are doing amazing stuff but it's often siloed away somewhere, and we don't get access to it. Or other organizations don't have their own research centers, but there are things like libraries and other research databases, commercial ones, that are really valuable. We can actually learn things from them and from other people's experiences in other contexts that can help us do our work. In one setting, um, I went in and I found to my both delight and uh, consternation 
that the user research people had brought in an agency to create mental model diagrams. So I was, I'm, I'm happy about that because I published the book on mental models. But I'm unhappy about that because it's yet another siloed, separate piece of really useful information that's not making its way around the organization to people who need to see it. And in that same organization, I found that the marketing people had brought in another company to do brand architecture, which is very much based on user research. Wow, that's interesting. But how do these th things fit together? Will we ever get the chance to fit them together? And then in other contexts, I see organizations using KPI like the Net Promoter Score, based primarily on surveys, and making that a very important way to understand their users. But that's often handled by another outside firm. So now we have silos that are crossing not only within the organization, but including people outside the organization that have their hands on critical controls when it comes to understanding users. So we're kind of tilting at new windmills here, or new silos, really. Uh, we have a siloed situation where um, what we're finding is organizations that get it and understand the value of user research are essentially overpaying for it because they're not putting it together. They're duplicating effort. Different departments are commissioning different studies or hiring different kinds of people uh, with different perspectives. And that's all good. But if you don't put it together, you're missing out the benefit of the sum being greater than the parts. So we're missing out on that combinatorial effect. So I kind of see this as a, a cartographic or a mapping challenge, uh, a, really a three-headed one. First of all, the insights that come from the, the great findings that all these really smart people are coming up with are fragmented in different silos. Secondly, it's hard to differentiate it. You don't always know exactly how they came up with those findings. What kinds of tools are they using? Are they using qualitative tools or quantitative tools? Are, is their data behavioral or attitudinal? We just don't really know in many cases. It's hard to understand how this stuff all fits together. And then that's the third challenge, synthesis, which is taking all these disparate pieces that come from different perspectives and from different silos and getting that combinatorial effect, the benefit of putting together interesting research in new ways to come up with really un incredible new findings. So what I try to do when I go into these organizations is do some mapping. And perhaps I'm not the best person to do that because I always end up coming up with a bunch of dichotomies. So let me run through some of these dichotomies that I'm finding to be pretty typical in organizations. And each dichotomy, obviously there's two things that are very different, but often they're very complementary, and therein lies a lot of opportunity. So one dichotomy, and I apologize, the cultural reference may not work here, uh, but Reese's is a candy back in the States whose uh, campaign is always uh, uh, shows two people, one eating chocolate and one eating peanut butter, and they collide, and their peanut butter and chocolate end up mixed, and it tastes better. So um, I think we have that kind of issue with a lot of the research that we're doing. For example, um, a lot of the stuff that I see is typically either conventional user research that a lot of us here are pretty familiar with, but also web analytics. Web analytics folks are very good at detecting and determining what is happening based on users' behaviors. Not necessarily very good at figuring out the why. They can come up with hypotheses, but then we need qualitative studies in many cases to help us answer the why questions. So there's a what and a why, which if you put together are really powerful, but they're often not combined. Another dichotomy, quantitative and qualitative. So. Um, a lot of this almost comes down to personality types, what we're comfortable with as, as individuals. Are we more comfortable with, with qualitative data, descriptive data? Are we more comfortable with statistical data? There's a, often sort of an a, a, a inborn distrust for the other. And I see this again and again. Now, I, I confess I'm overgeneralizing here. But um, I, I see that a lot of people who reflect these different types of analyses are often not working together in large organizations. Uh, I find that in many cases, the people operating the web analytics controls are really there to help the organization measure how well it's doing at performing its goals as an organization. So they're really there to meet the organization's goals. A lot of us on the user research side 
are all about advocating for the user and his or her goals. And those things are not always uh, in opposition, but there's obviously some differences there that we're not always so good at resolving because we don't really get to talk about it very much together. Another dichotomy, measuring the world that we know, which is what we're doing in certainly analytics in many cases. We are looking at data and trying to understand how well our organization is performing. Compare that to looking at data to figure out what you don't know, to look for patterns that didn't emerge until you look at the data differently, not with a goal-driven approach, but with more of an exploratory approach, where you look for insights to emerge simply from playing with the data. Those are two very different ways at approaching data that, again, go well nicely together, but often are not looked at together. The kind of data we're looking at is often statistical or, in many cases, descriptive. And again, a lot of us are really a lot more comfortable with one type or another. And that's fine, but not if we're not willing to then work with people who have a comfort with the other stuff. So I take these and I kind of put them together uh, into, as I call it, a, a table of highly overgeneralized dichotomies. And I'm only looking at web analytics and user experience here. Think of all the other silos I showed you earlier. That'd be a, quite a chart. I'm not sure I could come up with it. But just looking at these two perspectives to summarize what we just covered, um, what we analyze, what methods we employ, uh, what we're trying to achieve, how we use data, what kind of data we use. There's a lot of differences here, but a lot of opportunities to, know, to combine things. But as, as I said, this is the best thing I can come up with, in one slide at least, to show how things fit together. But I can't really map it. And being that it's difficult to map this landscape, if you will, why bother? You know, what is so good about putting these different perspectives and different types of data and different types of analyses together. Well, for one, there's a lot that we can learn from each other's data. We take very different perspectives to how we analyze data. So let me show you some data. And this is com comes from my favorite toy, search analytics. Um, I'm looking right here at a line of uh, tech, of, um, of a, uh, essentially one bit of a log it shows that someone was searching a site for something called Linson's Plate. If you were in my workshop yesterday, this should, this should be familiar. And they found zero results. And then the same person searched on License Plate, and they got 146 results. Now, each one of you is looking at this data, and your brains are already working with it. And very likely, you're coming up with different hypotheses. It might be that someone just did a misspelling the first time, then they did a search on license plate. Maybe some of you feel like they were happy with the results. Maybe some of you are questioning the results. Maybe they weren't necessarily happy. What else can we learn? How might we combine this data with other types of tools that we use to understand what users want? I'll give you one more line of code, uh, of, of logs, and uh, another query for, in this case, Regional Transportation Governance Commission. You look at that and you might say, boy, my users have very long queries in mind, or um, what kind of users are these, maybe, you're asking yourself, who would use that type of query. There's all kinds of things that your brains do when you look at this, and they're all good and they're all valid. So one question you might come up with, let's say if you're a web analytics person, is, huh, are we converting license plate renewals? So you're thinking about conversions. Uh, another question that you might have come up with very different is, what are people searching for the most? Is it license plates? Is it something else? So our brains on data do very different things, and they're all very valid, but we don't take the opportunity to get different brains together to look at the same data sets and compare what we find. Improving each other's design tools, I find, is, is a pretty interesting opportunity as well. So I grabbed this uh, persona from Adaptive Path, and I added a little bit to make it a more of a data-driven persona. Uh, I've, again, search analytics is my thing these days. So I added, what does Stephen search? What does this persona want to find? And actually, I can 
in many cases, find data that can be injected into a persona. Now, that makes the persona not only more useful in many regards, but it makes it more influential to other people who might look at a persona and say, well, that's all well and good, but it's just made up. Well, it's not entirely made up. We actually have some data to make it more real. One thing I really like is the idea of helping each other tell stories from our data and about our findings. And some of us tell stories in different ways. Some of us are stronger storytellers. So let me give you an example. Unfortunately, um, uh, he's not here today, but Jeff Veen and his team uh, went to Google to work on Google Analytics some years ago. And many analytics applications are, are kind of weak in terms of user experience. They don't really tell a story. They just provide reports. All right, well, reports are reports. Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not, but they tend to be the kinds of things that we take for granted. However, when you take an analytics tool and you get a bunch of user experience people there to work on it, they start telling the story of the reports in more effective ways. So they flipped the idea around and said, reports are essentially answers to questions. Let's bring the questions to the fore. So what you see on the right there are essentially the reports labeled in ways that are more engaging and help make the answers in the reports more understandable. So I think this is one of the, the, the aside the fact that Google Analytics is free, I think this is actually equally important, is that it's, it, it tells a story in ways that many other analytics apps don't. And I attribute this to the combination of a lot of great brains that Google put together, including a bunch of UX people like Jeff. Um, Sometimes we're really good at helping each other solve problems that we can't necessarily solve on our own. So a nice story that I, I learned from uh, Jared Spool some years ago. Uh, it was uh, Land's End, which is a clothing retailer in the States, a large website. And um, they were looking through their search logs and found that people were searching on the product numbers, the SKU numbers. The SKUs were not on the website. So first of all, there's a problem because if you search a product ID, or an SKU, same thing. You should be able to find that product pretty easily, and people weren't. So they, they found a problem that they could fix pretty easily. But they were really kind of curious as to well, why are the, the SKUs even coming up in the first place? How do people know these things? They did a field study. They went into people's homes, into customers' homes, and they found that people were using the printed catalog, the type of thing they'd been receiving for years and years and years, every few months, which is a nice information system with high resolution images and it's understandable and they could use it and they would look up products. But then they would rather use this new approach to ordering things, the website, to go ahead and make the transaction rather than dealing with a human being over the toll-free line. Okay, so there was something learned there, not only about a problem that could be immediately addressed, but about broader behaviors because they combined an analytics approach with a more qualitative approach. And that's really powerful. And look, we can also test each other's hypotheses out in new ways. So here's an example from Netflix. Netflix is like, uh, uh, someone told me it's a love film, film love from the UK. Uh, it's essentially a, an online uh, movie and TV show ordering service. And um, they're really interested in how the data can help them not only tell a story, but identify problems. So let me walk you through this bit of ugly data. Um, on the, on the uh, right-hand side, these are the things that people are searching, like Click and The Departed and Thank You for Smoking, movie titles, TV show titles. These are the things people want, and they're, they're sorted by most frequent to least frequent. So these are the really pop most popular things during this particular time period. And um, then what we're looking at is, of those, how many were being added, or a click-through, I'm sorry, being click-through, and of those, how many were then being added to the shopping cart, to the queue? Now, you can look at success and say, thank you for smoking, it was searched for a lot, it was click-through a lot, and it was added to the uh, queue quite often. But what Netflix really cares about is failure. Here's one lost that was searched a lot, clicked through a lot, and added to the queue at an alarmingly low rate. Why is that? I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses that you can come up with. 
Uh, usually when I ask this question in a workshop, there's probably five or six reasonable hypotheses. But the thing is, this type of analysis is very specialized, and it takes different brains, including people who understand the broad business model, to make this work. You couldn't get this out of your standard uh, CAN reports of an analytics application. You actually have to think about it with different brains and put it together in new ways and test out your hypotheses in new ways. So this is really the, the challenge that I see organizations heading to. Once they sort of get over the hump of realizing that user research, or if they call it customer research or market research, whatever they call it, is valuable. Now their next challenge is taking all those pieces and putting them together to think with a, a, a whole research brain. So how do practitioners, how do folks in the trenches get to this point? It's not easy because really what we're talking about is organizational change. So you're always going to be pushing upstream to a large degree, but I think there are some things that we can do, and some of them are painfully obvious. Just getting outside your silo. I was just talking with someone uh, in uh, the IA Summit, Samantha Starmer, who works at uh, REI, another retailer in the States. And she works in the user research team, or the, actually the UX team, and she told us that she makes a point of leaving her building and walking across campus to where the marketing people are and sitting there in their cafeteria during lunch. This is just unbelievable. Why would anyone do such a thing? But she does it, and she's making small but meaningful connections with other people. And you know, ultimately, a lot of our differences come from dehumanizing each other through not knowing each other. And when you know someone, then you can actually begin understanding and opening up a dialogue. And little things are not only effective, but symbolic in a really important way. Another thing that I really find powerful, um, if you're not familiar with Dave Gray um, um, from X-Plane, the visual thinking folks, uh, his book is Game Storming, which I highly recommend, one of his books. Um, Dave, um, I was talking with him about this sort of issue of how do we take fields that are sort of related but haven't really found each other effectively and are having a, a challenge with dialogue to have a dialogue in more meaningful ways. And he, he said, oh, you, what you need are boundary objects. So boundary objects are objects that basically um, have meaning in different fields. They may be labeled in different ways, they may be understood a little differently, but they're nonetheless common. And when you can identify boundary objects, you have a starting point for a broader dialogue. And Dave actually blew up the idea and even further from after our conversation and came up with the concept of boundary matrices. But just a couple of boundary objects that you might consider. Uh, if you're in user research, uh, you may be thinking about goals. Uh, a lot of people on the web analytics side, if you're trying to communicate with them, they think of goals in terms of KPI. And many ways are the same thing, expressed differently, one in a more quantitative way than the other. But there's a lot of shared understanding of what you're trying to do. And if you can get over the hump of just connecting those words together in some more effective ways, then you're getting somewhere. Another one is uh, audience segments and personas. They are not necessarily the same thing, but they occasionally can be, and they share a lot in common. So you can talk about your personas with someone who thinks in terms of audience segments and start making some progress. And invariably, there are many other potential boundary objects for you to explore, but those are just a couple examples. Um, I said I'm not a very good mapper, but I, I do think that a lot of you are very good mappers. Maybe the kind of maps that you're doing, uh, we were talking about this at breakfast today, the uh, uh, sketch notes, or, or just the types of things that you do because you maybe are more visual than I am. But a lot of you are really great at mapping spaces because you're very visual as well as conceptual. So um, I think a lot of people like us can make a big difference in terms of developing maps. So here's an example of a map. Uh, it's, it's attributed to both um, Christian Rohrer, but also uh, Steve Mulder and Ziv Yar. Steve gave the, one of the workshops yesterday. He's here. Um, and this is a, a landscape of user research methods. And I love this. I think this is just unbelievable. It takes uh, a huge amount of information and maps it in a fairly effective way, taking user research methods and showing uh, the breakdown along a quantitative, qualitative spectrum and a behavioral attitudinal spectrum. Uh, I highly recommend it, but it's imperfect. Sorry, Steve. Uh, it's very much influenced by how people from our perspective see user research. So a lot of the things in the analytics side, for example, are kind of stuffed up in the upper right-hand corner. Contrast that with the current 
star in web analytics, Avinash Kaushik, another really brilliant guy. And here's his view, his Trinity diagram, Trinity uh, strategy for pulling together all the things that they do to, to understand users. And our stuff is kind of limited to the lower right-hand corner, the usability, and some A-B testing and customer satisfaction stuff. So this is another great but imperfect map of a broader space. And I think the more maps like this we have, and looking at them collectively, the more chances we are, uh, are going to have of having a really amazing true map that works for everyone. So those are some ideas for, for people who are practitioners to make a difference. But in my experience, this is a really hard thing. It openly does come down to organizational change. And when organizational change is a goal, it's really hard to do it without these folks involved, decision makers. Now, the thing I find really interesting is decision makers. We use that term kind of blindly, forgetting that ultimately their goal is to make decisions. And do we ever critically look at that process? I don't know, maybe they do, but I, seeing what they do in many client sites makes me really wonder. So um, how, if you were going to create a decision-making apparatus for a large organization, would it look anything like what you have today? What we have today has emerged organically. Oh, we have this silo here because those are the web analytics people and they do Omniture. We have that silo over there and so forth. It just sort of happens organically. But if you were going to design it, I don't think it would look like that. And I, I really encourage, if you have the opportunity, if you are a decision maker or work with decision makers, to consider an exercise uh, around blue skying this process. What would a user research apparatus or an organizational brain, if you will, for making decisions look like? And when you're having that discussion, I highly also encourage you, sorry, it's a little scary picture, to um, ban certain terms. And I, I'm, I don't, I'm a librarian. I'm one of those guys who hates the idea of banned books. But I find that at least shelving certain terms during discussions can be really useful. Um, I, I think terms like uh, focus group or product names, oh, the omniture people, or these types of things ultimately become crutches. They become meaningless words that obscure us from understanding what those people are really trying to accomplish. Because you start getting into these things, these, these terms that ultimately reinforce the silos. They're their own uh, local patois. They don't really connect very well to each other. I highly encourage you to abstract back to a common language around decision making. Um, some sort of map, some sort of table, something to help you there. This is my uh, effort. I think that the Kaushik and, and Mulder, Yar, Roar versions are, are actually more useful. Maybe multiple maps or frameworks are useful. But ultimately, we kind of have to have some sort of broader framework for that type of discussion about how we make decisions. And what I've tried to do here is not use too many of those crutch words, too many of those meaningless terms. Now, you guys are in a position then to help these people design this decision-making apparatus. Now, most executives like the idea of dashboards because they operate large organizations, and dashboards are a way to do that. At least they seem like they're a way to do that. And I suggest this as a good starting point for what you're trying to create. But what you'll find is this metaphor, as most metaphors do, breaks down quite quickly. Um, the metaphor of a dashboard is, is really good with quantitative data, it's not so good with qualitative data. And what we really want to be able to do is have dials for all the various findings that we have, but also lines to connect them together to show how they fit and to get that combinatorial effect. So we can't really draw the lines very easily on a dashboard. And one of the other problems with the dashboard is they're sequencing when you connect your user research that came from uh, analyzing uh, clickstream data to your task analysis exercise that you did in the lab. There's a progression, a time-based progression, that doesn't really show up well or render well as a dashboard. So this is way beyond my area of expertise, but I have a, a guess that designers, certainly, like you are, can really work on this problem and design some sort of concept of how decisions involving user research 
can and, and should get made in a large organization. But whatever you do, whatever kind of structure you create, ultimately is meaningless unless you can get actual people from these different silos together, whether it is going and sitting in the lunchroom with people that you don't typically work with. Now, leaders, decision makers, are in a role where they can sometimes do this, where they can sometimes pull together people from different silos, but ultimately they have to be willing to reevaluate things like incentives. What is the incentive to do things outside your silo? There often aren't those sorts of things in place, and so they reinforce the divisions. So ultimately, I think um, they have to be involved in getting people together of different types, and people who are really good at ultimately, like many of us, telling a story with people who are really good at knowing the data. I'll leave this up for just a second, because it is kind of funny. Or are you all too young to know about this meeting? <laughs> So ultimately, where does this all go? I think we're in a position, or some companies and organizations are in a position to really, really win it. The companies that understand that it's not just about user research, but synthesizing that research, get the sum being greater than the parts, putting together different pieces of the brain to come up with an overall unified decision-making process. Though the ones that are gonna be way ahead I think that's the special sauce, and um, I hope you get there, and I hope this presentation might help. Thanks very much. I've been told to sit on a couch. Right. So uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, and there are people with mics. Any questions or comments? Any tomatoes to throw? Anything? Here's one right up front. Hello? Hi. Okay. Morning. Um, you, you talked about motivations and organizations setting up motivations for people to cross over. Uh, can you uh, give a, one or two examples specifically? I wish I could give good examples. I, I, I think it comes down to um, giving people motivations to, to not just do what they've been hired to do. So um, if you're a product manager, for example, and I've seen this in a lot of organizations, your goal is to sell the most product uh, of your product that you can, but your organization might sell other products. And so um, what's your incentive to be involved in cross-sale? And what's your incentive to make sure your web environment supports that? That's sort of someone else's problem, really. You're just there to, to sell stuff. Well, maybe your incentive ought to be not just based on the, the success of your product, but on the success of your company as a whole. And that's really what I'm getting at, is we, we, we're so, these organizations are so big that the incentive structures become so localized without in having people invested in the greater good. And another example uh, is just content owners and, and content managers who focus in on their own content without understanding that it's part of a greater whole. There are, because there are more and more tools to help them see how well their content does in that greater system. But that has to be institutionalized. And so um, uh, maybe metrics that help reward or incent people around how well their, their, search re their content is showing up in local site search results is another idea. So just getting people to see that what they do goes beyond what they do. Other questions? I'm, that might be it. Oh, there's one right there. Okay. Um, what, what would you say is the ideal mix between qualitative and quantitative, would you say? I mean, in, in your travels through companies that you've dealt with. I, I can't really say there's an ideal mix. 
I, I just don't know uh, what it would be. I think it's very dependent. And, you know, if you're, if you're a, a, a manufacturer of, of scientific instrumentation, you're, you're probably going to have a different skew than if you're an entertainment site. Um, so it, I think the, the, my answer, my weaselly answer would be, I don't know what the ideal mix is. I just think it's ideal to have a mix. A mix. Yeah. A mix mm -hmm. whatsoever. To, 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 I mean, and most organizations have both. They just, again, aren't really looking for ways to combine them more effectively. Anything else? All right. We're all set. Thank you. Thank you.